Welcome to another episode of Money You Should Ask. I'm your host, Bob Wheeler, and in this episode, we're going to explore, question, examine, converse, dig deep, expose, laugh, and cry about the money beliefs, money blocks, and life challenges of our next guest. Turn up the volume, listen, learn, and laugh. Good news, bad news. Bad news first. Growth comes from learning, which is a lifelong endeavor. Good news, growth comes from learning, which is a lifelong endeavor. At the Money Nerve Academy, we hold space to explore, navigate, discover, and heal your relationship with money. With our online course, Mastering the Emotions of Money, you can get in touch with your fears, blocks, and beliefs around money so that you can become more aware of your current financial story. By understanding why you do what you do with your money, you can create a different ending to your financial story than the one currently taking place. Check out themoneynerve.com and start mastering your emotions of money. So I have a great guest today. We're going to dig deep. Um, and we're also going to talk about trust. Um, and that's not like trusting someone. We're talking about like a legal document, a trust. There's a big difference. Uh, today we have with us Nick Van Brunt. And he is the partner at the Business Trial Practice Group of Shepard Mullen. He focuses practice on resolving disputes over trusts, estates, conservatorships, and other fiduciary matters. We'll talk about what is fiduciary. A respected member of the LA legal community, he is known as a pragmatic and effective trust and estates litigator who seeks to achieve favorable results for his clients through skillful negotiation, strategic counsel, and deft trial work. He has developed an impressive roster of clients who value his discretion, experience, and accessible approach. His typical client matters include will and trust contests, breach of fiduciary duty cases, trustee accounting matters, conservatorship proceedings, and cases involving the intersection between probate law and other legal issues. And we've done a few of those things together. (laughs) Uh, Nick has his JD from the George Washington University Law School, and he's got a resume that's about you know, as long as war and peace is pretty impressive. So check it out. Nick, thanks for being here today. Thanks. Thanks for having you, having me and you. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, (laughs) now, you know, we have a mutual friend that said that uh, this was probably going to be the funniest podcast ever because he said you were probably, uh, you should be (laughs) doing stand up, but you gave that up to serve the people. I that 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 is a hundred percent false, but I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you this. When you were seven years old, were you already preparing for litigation on trusts? You know, it's funny. When I was when I was seven years old, I actually wanted to be a therapist and you know, we'd have to get pretty deep into my ha- family history to to explain why. But um that actually in a sense bears more on my practice than wanting to be a lawyer, which is what did happen as time went along. You know, by by high school, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And then when I was 18 and um, finishing high school in Los Angeles and moving up north for college, I said, you know, I'm never moving back to this city and I'm never going to be a lawyer. So I then <laughs> moved back after law school, moved back here and became a lawyer. Um, and uh, even then, I, I I thought I was going to do other types of law. I was interested in antitrust and intellectual property, and then ended up getting a, a position more as a general litigator with a large firm in LA. And that was interesting experience. I was working on the Enron litigation for one of the banks, um, like one of sixty lawyers on a on a team, and it, it was exciting. But I also realized I was not going to get into a courtroom, and I was not going to be doing what I really wanted to do, which was represent individuals who have problems, which is yeah. now the the vast uh, majority of my practice. So I ended up taking a job with um, Adam Streisand at Loeb & Loeb in his trust and estate litigation practice. And uh, that's how we got to know each other you know, yeah. at one point in time. And then uh, uh, about almost six years ago now, I moved over to Shepard Mullen and uh, it's, it's been great. So spend my days uh, dealing with issues over trusts and estates and conservatorships, as, as you said. And I would imagine you do a lot of therapy with your clients. I mean, exactly. I imagine you have to do a lot of talking people off the ledge. Exactly. You know, um, I had a partner in my old firm who used to say that she would tell clients that, you know, a therapist would be cheaper. Um, <laughs> I don't say that because I, I, I mean, it's true, but, but it's also, it's, it's part and parcel of the whole process, right? When you're, when you're dealing with a trust and estate litigation matter, more often than not, there's grievance going on. There's a lost family member. There's 
difficulties with um, other family members or family friends. And so you have to talk through the emotional issues as well as the, you know, the hard money issues, the litigated issues. And so I think you, you have to have that sensitivity to it. I'm not a licensed therapist or anything like that, but right. you do have to have a certain empathy, I think, to to do well in this practice. You have to be a trusting trust lawyer. <laughs> exactly. You have to be able to build trust to fight about trusts. Exactly. Yeah. Two kinds of trust, but both are important. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the most common trust, I would imagine, is the living trust. Yes. Or I one think, of the most common? Probably, yeah. I mean, I in California, certainly, it's very typical that you would have a living trust, which is revocable during the lifetime of the, the settlor, who's the person who sets up the trust. Right. And for people don't, that don't know, so a living trust is I put all my stuff, my, my properties, my bank accounts, very important, yes. and putting all that in a trust so that when I pass, they don't have to probate it, which could mean a lot of money. That's right. That's right. So um, with, with an asterisk, but, but that is right. So what you do, you, you, um, you, you go to a competent estate planning lawyer, you set up a trust, you'd make sure you transfer everything into that trust. As you said, bank accounts, real estate, you put it all in the name of the trust. In California, it's actually in the name of the trustee of the trust, but it's the same concept so that when you die, you know that unless there's some sort of other issue in the family, you're not going to have to go to probate court and right. have to go through a you know a year plus long process to have your assets distributed to your family and pay statutory legal fees to to attorneys and to the executor. So now a common thing I hear from people is, well, they can just pay for that when I'm dead. They can just take it out of what I leave them. Um, is that a good idea? I mean, it's great. It's great for my practice. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure that that. No, I mean, it, first of all, um, if you're doing that, that's because you've either done no estate planning, at which point you're really creating an expensive and potentially painful process where you also, by the way, have no ability to dictate what happens to your assets. You're stuck with whatever the California legislature has decided should happen with your estate. Um the other way that people say it is, well, I'll just do a will. I don't need to do a trust. A trust is more expensive. A, that's not always true. But but B, you know, a simple will. Even then, you have to go through the process, um, and, and you're you're beholden to what a judge ultimately orders and puts your you know family through. So yeah, I mean, it's yes, you you could do that, but you're you're leaving a lot more to chance. So if you care about what happens to your stuff. When you die, right. a trust is, is definitely the best vehicle to do that. Well, now the other thing I often hear is, yeah, but it costs four or five thousand dollars. The ones that everybody says are good or more, and I could just get it on Legal Zoom for maybe five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks because it's a trust. I mean, it's they're all the same, right? So that that is um, that is also very good for my practice. A lot of my <laughs> cases, um, in all seriousness, not necessarily. I don't want to dunk on Legal Zoom, but involve either pre-planned forms that were signed where people didn't think about all the language that right. goes into it that creates fun interpretation issues later in court or they've just gone to a general practitioner who dabbles and doesn't really understand the nuances of you know what can happen if if trusts go bad and so that leads potentially to tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees in court, potentially fighting over issues, depositions, discovery, letting a judge decide rather than you. So spending the four or $5,000 is really like, you know, you get homeowner's insurance. This is right. like insurance for, you know, what happens to your stuff when you die, you know? Yeah, it's... I. Look, I, I complain about paying the money too <laughs> because I, I sure. spent about $5,000 for my living trust. And uh, I'm assuming you have a living trust. I do. Okay, awesome. Just yeah. walking the talk, walking the talk. So what do you find is the most common excuse for people uh, either from what they've told you as they're dealing with the trust gone bad or they're thinking about doing a trust? Are there any common excuses? Like, you know, I've heard some people say, well, if I... If I work on my estate, people are just going to wait for me to die and count my money. So I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've definitely heard that anecdotally. Usually by the time people are coming to my partners to do planning or 
they've come to us, they've already made that initial step where they realize that they need to do it. Yeah. The problem that you'll have is once you've made the commitment to do that, there are some hoops you have to jump through. A common example is if if grandma or grandpa is in their eighties, they're still you know they still are with it, but their short term memory might not be where it once was, and people will think that means that they lack capacity. It doesn't necessarily at all, but you know you'll say you know you should really get evaluated by a doctor. First, okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll just go to my physician. Well, maybe you want to go to someone independent. Oh, well, I'm going to have to pay that person, you know, X dollars to do that. I don't want to do that. Well, again, it's the insurance idea, right? Cheaper to do it now than to have your family fighting over it later. This is coming from the same money that's going to be going to them. Anyway, if you're in the fortunate position to, to have a trust that has meaningful assets in it, you're just, you're, you're, you're slightly increasing now by not paying the cost, the amount of money that they will fight over later, thereby greatly depleting that trust. So, yeah, I mean, well, yeah. it, what comes to mind is like uh, Prince died without uh, mm -hmm. any of his legal stuff in order and That's apparently right. potential kids and siblings and half siblings, yeah. and it, it's probably going to be years. Um, and, it, and in certain, well, yeah. in certain states, right, I, I understand in certain states, like, I think in Minnesota or something like that, if there's not a certain portion can go to the state or all of it can go to the state or like you're out of, con you don't have control basically. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not sure in Minnesota whether some stuff uh, cheats to the state or not, but I do know that um, in that situation, I mean, there's, most people don't have the amount of intellectual property and, you know, everything that Prince had, but the, the sheer fact that you didn't have any estate planning in place there, forget all the people who come out of the woodwork and say that they're related to him somehow, because there was definitely all of that. But there's also just, you know, who's going to be in charge of the intellectual property rights going forward? Who's going to make the decisions as to what happens with his catalog? You know, who's, right. And, you know, so you have the fighting over who gets what, but then you have the fighting over who manages all of it too. And that's a really right. important aspect of estate planning. You know, we've been talking about sort of the who gets the stuff, but it's also who's in charge going forward. And that's a really right. important decision, you know, um, that again, you're leaving the chance if you don't do the planning. Yeah. And then sometimes you might have a situation, right, where uh, you do all the planning, but something to get moved into the, into the trust, um, which could be something right. like a major business that now the conservator wants to take control of uh, instead of the trustee of the trust. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that, that certainly can happen where um, if you haven't if you haven't put everything in the trust already you're gonna you could have control issues during life you know if so for example right now you're in great shape you set up your trust you put your business in in that trust let's say you lose capacity at some point you're still alive but your trusted trustee is going to take over and manage the business if you've done the planning that can be very seamless not always but you're definitely maximizing the chances of that. If you don't do the planning, it's exactly what you just talked about. You know, suddenly there's going to be a fight over who controls the business right. going forward. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are so many different reasons you want to get your ducks in a row while you still can, you know. What, what's the best way? Because, of course, after somebody passes and then you realize, oh, there were five other questions I meant to ask. Um, and at that point, it's too late. How do you how can one start to go about trying to figure out what are the things I need to address? I mean, uh, right. Like do, do, do I have my banking login information right. or, uh, does, did I list out all my assets or do I have some hidden safety deposit box? Like, right. I mean, do you take an inventory? Do yeah. You yeah. So, so at the planning stage, I mean, one of the things that, that people should do and that the good estate planners will have you do is, do a complete list of all your assets, including everything you're putting in the trust. And sometimes things you might want to have outside the trust. Um, for example, you might have a, a bank account where you just name someone as a beneficiary of that mm -hmm. account and it passes outside the trust. That, that's okay. That can all, there can be logical reasons for doing that. But you want to have all of that written out. Certainly having your passwords for your email and your bank accounts and all of that somewhere safe. Um, right. 
Um, the, there is interesting and ever changing law around how digital assets pass and how the rights to um, to control an email account, even after somebody passes. Um, that's another reason to engage in planning so that you have some sort of direction that you've given to people so there's not a free for all and you know people aren't you don't have any number of people saying they're the ones that can go through your uh, all of your emails right after you die right. as well um, and then in terms of account information obviously you save your um, your trustee a lot of headaches if you leave those account you know um, if you leave the the passwords for them if you leave account information for them so they know where to go probably if there's a banking officer you've dealt with leaving their contact information you know that that's all why planning is so important you know um, it just makes things easier for the people you care about when you die yeah what are, so what are some um, can you are there any stories that you can think of um, where, wow, that was heart-wrenching. If they had only done this, um, the impact wouldn't have been so bad. Or I wished, I wish somebody had, you know, ahead of time told them A, B, and C. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I could think of one example. I want to be careful about not talking about, sure. you know, cases. Or in generalities. Yeah, yeah, in generalities. But, um, you know, here, here, here's a, a situation that's all too common. You have a family business. You have siblings um, who are, um, you know, who are the logical, um, you know, successors to, right. to the family business. The patriarch or the matriarch who built the business believes that they're immortal. Maybe they even do some planning, but they don't, they just simply don't have the conversations right. with their, their kids while they're still competent and still able to do so and say, this is how I want things to go. And maybe you would even, you know, you would hope to even see some something in writing that says we all understand that. It's difficult to have those conversations, it's difficult to confront your own death. If you want one child over another child to be in charge for various reasons, that can cause um, difficulty and guilt. I, I understand all of that. It's really the best thing for my practice when people don't do that because it leads to massive litigation in the future over fights over control of the family business, right? So um, that's one thing I see increasingly is just people don't have the hard conversations. So you have litigation afterwards over control. Um, but, you know, another thing, you know, I alluded to it before, you know, you sort of wished people had gone, if there was any sort of question about capacity that they'd gone to see, um, see a doctor ahead of time to get an evaluation, you know, um, because otherwise what happens, and this may happen anyway, but if there's a fight over the estate, there's massive discovery subpoenas to every doctor under the sun. If people live long enough, they've got dozens of doctors, you know, um, and it's just, it's not only expensive, it's just, it can be ugly, right? You're like looking yeah. under the, you know, the cover and it's just, um, you know, that can be really painful for families too. Um, you know, one, one other um, thing that I do see happen that I wish didn't happen, and I actually teach other lawyers about this, in very rare circumstances, is it a good idea to videotape someone signing a document or signing a will? People seem to think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. If you've just got the words on the page and you've got like a medical evaluation, the, the burdens of proof are going to be on your side in most cases. You know, it's going to be up to the person contesting the will to try to show that you lack capacity or you were defrauded into signing it or something like that. It's going to be the burden of the other, of the contestant. The best evidence they can have is they can have the videotape where they can freeze frame and, you know, get like a, a bad, uh, a, a bad moment from, from the, you know, from the testator, the settler of the trust, the testator being the person who signs the will. Um, or you can get a, you know, you can take a snippet and show that, you know, there there may not be clarity as to what they're doing because, you know, a trust instrument can be sixty pages long. I can count on one hand probably the number of clients I know that have read every line of the trust that they're signing. They're relying on their right. lawyers, so you're just giving people an opportunity to poke holes. So that's that's just one thing I see happen that I don't necessarily think is a good idea. Yeah. And I imagine that you have to keep your emotions in check a little bit when you're dealing with clients that are 
crying on your doorstep or yeah. this isn't fair and this this is what they meant and right. um Tugs Absolutely. at your heartstrings, I would imagine. Oh, it totally does. You know, um, like anything else, if you do something for long enough, you you start to build up some some distance. But that doesn't mean you lose your empathy. I mean, um, I had a situation recently where uh, we had a fight over um, whether or not the father was going to get an autopsy and how he was the, the remains were going to be disposed of. And obviously, that's an incredibly fraught time in people's lives and you have to maintain an even keel you don't have to be completely clinical about it you got to be human but you have to understand what's going on but realize that your role as the attorney in that situation is to be the steady you know to be the steady hand you're their advocate you can you know be zealous and fight with opposing counsel when you need to but when you're talking to them you need to really you know just be steady um we were able to resolve that issue pretty quickly luckily but um but yeah, I mean, you're you're dealing with people um, at some of the most difficult moments in their lives, and you you have to be attuned to that and just be steady. Yeah, yeah, I've seen situations where like the husband did a new will with the new wife, uh, didn't do everything properly, and now wife number two that's been with them for 10, 15 years uh, gets usurped by the first wife because they go back to the first will because that seemed to have standing. Or, you know, or somebody was named as a beneficiary that's now the, the black sheep of the family and they're getting the bulk of the inheritance by a technicality. Yeah, that, that absolutely will happen, which is why, you know, if you have major life changes, you should always look to update your estate plan. Um, again, you know, I don't want to sound like, oh, that's because I want you to pay more lawyers. I mean, once you've set up your trust, amending it's usually a less expensive endeavor. But but beyond that, you just want to make sure that whenever your time comes, and it's coming for all of us, that you've got the most up to date statement of what you want to have happen out there. You know, and, and that's how you avoid those situations. The law does try to provide some protection. Um, so, you know, if you have the the will that names the predecessor spouse. Technically, they're going to be disinherited, but I've I litigated a case for years. I mean, this is going back several years where um, there was incomplete, there was an incomplete dissolution proceeding. You know, so even though it was questionable as to whether the deceased husband really wanted the estranged wife to get assets, there was a fight over that, and then at the same time. You know, the people that come in instead are the siblings who never had a relationship with them. Again, all could have been solved by better planning. You know, so yeah, that happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, um, I remember there was a year. I think it was two thousand when the tax, the estate tax law changed. Two thousand ten. Well, two thousand oh, it changed too, I guess. But yeah, I, well, there's one yeah. where they were going to get rid of the inheritance tax for a couple years. That was two thousand ten. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then a lot of people, I think, probably uh, might have. There were a lot of deaths in December. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was certainly something people were, were worried about. Well, no, I had, a, I had a major litigation about that very issue because um, the estate plan that had put, been put in place had... This is going to get a little technical. I'm going to try to not get too technical, but it had, it's called, <laughs> called a formula clause in it. And what the formula clause provided was everything that... Um, you know, will pass free of estate tax, will go to my kids through the bypass trust, through this trust. And then the remainder that's subject to something called the marital deduction, which is something that would go to the surviving spouse after um, an estate tax exemption is met, will, um, will go to the marital trust. Well, she dies in 2010, the first to die, and there's no estate tax. So everything's supposed to end up going to the kids. Right. And nothing goes to the surviving spouse, where normally before that, I think the estate tax exemption in 2009 was three and a half million dollars. So yeah. three and a half million dollars would have gone to the bypass trust. I don't know, $50 million would have gone to the marital trust. And so we ended up having a huge uh, case about that. So. so how did you, like, there's a lot of technical stuff that you have to know. Is it like you just read a couple of books and then you're good to go? Um, it takes yeah. years of working under other people. Like it's a very specific uh, 
it's a very specific part of the law. Well, yeah, it is. And and you I'm sure you know this a little bit from your own practice, you know, as an accountant, it's, you know, you go to school and, and you learn the basics in law school. And then as you specialize in anything, you just start to learn more by doing, right? So yes, I, I do a fair amount of reading. I'm, I'm on, you know, um, the state bar. Well, it's not the state bar. It's now the California Lawyers Association Trust and Estates Executive Committee that puts out a lot of educational material and I have to stay up in legislation. So I do a fair amount of reading, you know, just constantly, but it's not like... I read trust litigation for dummies and then, you know, then I was good. You have to stay up on everything. And it's the same with you as an accountant. You got to, you know, sort of stay up on the changes with, with the tax laws, right? As they go along. No, totally. Well, now I don't know if you know this, but I was pre-law. So I I took uh, constitution law, law and legal research. Um, like, but I think for me, there were two things. One, I met a couple of lawyers and I went, uh, I, don't know I, I don't know if I like them. Right. Um, and I was actually taking accounting just to sort of help my grade point average because it was an easy A at the time. <laughs> and, um, but for me, like, I loved doing the legal research. I loved the briefs. I loved all of that. But I was actually scared about the part that you like to do, which is to litigate, is to get up in front of a whole mm-hmm. audience and then you have to be right, or at least appear to be right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, no, that's, that's, it takes a certain type of um, mentality, I think, to want to litigate. And for me, it's not that I necessarily like fighting with people. I actually like solving problems more than fighting mm-hmm. with people. And I think most good litigators do feel that way because... You know, it's like anything else. If you can find an armistice, you know, what's an armistice? If you can, if you can resolve a matter through diplomacy rather than going to war, it's better for everybody, right? Than leaving bodies yeah. on the ground. But sometimes you have to litigate. And you know, I was, uh, I wasn't a theater major, but I did a lot of acting in high school and uh, played, you know, um, played in rock bands and like performing. So yeah. notwithstanding this particular performance today, um, <laughs> I do like getting in front of people and speaking. And um, so I'm just comfortable doing it. So I think if you're comfortable in front yeah. of an audience, it's actually you get a rush out of it. And especially when you're advocating for somebody else, a lot of us, it's it's easier for us to argue for other people than it is for ourselves. You right. know, sometimes I... I I would be a terrible lawyer for myself, as most most lawyers would be. Um, right? Like, ah, oh, it's it's not worth it. It's it's you know. But if if the same problem is happening to my client, it's like you know I'm ready to go. And so, um, so yeah. But there's so many lawyers who are great lawyers who don't like, as you're saying, who don't like being in front of an audience. Don't yeah. Like the uncertainty associated with leaving it all up to the judge and. Um, Thank God for them because they're the ones that, that you know create the documents that really help people. The the planners who create the documents that don't end up on my desk because they did the right thing for the family, you know, yeah. um, and they they were thoughtful and they they planned as well as they could. That's not to say that there's always a chance given personalities that things are going to go awry, but there's so many different things that lawyers can do, and transactional work is super important. And I'm glad other people do it because I, I couldn't. No, absolutely. <laughs> well, now I have this question: When you deal with your, uh, when your family, with your own family, with your wife and kids, do you approach them as a litigator or <laughs> uh, a lawyer and like make them build their case if they don't do their chores? <laughs> do well, you- so I, I'm most often a defendant. Okay, um, <laughs> but um, yeah. my, my second role uh, is usually as mediator. I would say <laughs> um, I have a 12 year old and a nine year old who are um, the the you know, the child of two lawyers, uh, Eva, my wife practiced for a few years and now she does, uh, marketing and PR for, for law firms. And, um, so, you know, they're used to hearing us have discussions and they're very good at finding the, the loopholes. loopholes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes I have to, you know, be the judge and, and shoot things down. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> you're right. Okay, you, you, you can go on your phone. You now. win, overruled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're right, that wasn't consistent. Um, but a lot of times it's mediating the disputes between the 12-year-old and the nine-year-old. Yeah. Now, are you going to encourage them to both be lawyers or yeah, go into def- something completely different? Uh, definitely not. I mean, I certainly if they wanted to, I'm, I would be supportive of it. Um, both of my parents... Um, 
were not lawyers. My dad's uh, really an artist who worked in advertising. My mom's really a writer who had various jobs in the entertainment industry. And, um, you know, they produced a lawyer. So I, I sort of believe that things flip flop over time. Mm-hmm. And so that both my kids will end up being artists. Like, you know, my older son is is theatrical and really good at editing and stuff like that. So I could see him in the entertainment field. Uh, my younger son wants to be a professional gamer if baseball doesn't work out. So he has headphones like these. Um, but yeah, if they wanted to be a lawyer, I'd uh, I'd obviously be supportive, and you know, obviously would have some guidance to give them. So that would be nice. What's the hardest part about being a lawyer besides having to create like three hundred hours in a week? <laughs> Available. <laughs> yeah, hours. yeah. Well, um, I don't know. I mean. I'm going to stand out, take it just outside from me and just speak more generally. I, mm-hmm. I think you have a lot of um, people who are carrying other people's problems around with them and myself too. And um, it can lead to depression, right? It can lead yep. to um, a lot of stress. Um, there's rampant substance abuse, you know, in the, mm-hmm. in the legal industry. It's not only in the legal industry, but um, there are... Um, people who have health issues that come up, our health insurance premiums could be pretty high. You know, yeah. um, it's, it's a high stress job because again, you're carrying around other people's problems, you know, and trying to solve them. We can also thrive on that, you know, but yeah, that's, that's definitely the, you know, I'd say that's the hard part. And, you know, when I talk, I've, you know, obviously my field can get pretty emotional. I have friends in the criminal, you know, law field, both prosecutors and defense attorneys, I mean, they're they're carrying around people's lives in their hands, you know, um, and so you know it can, particularly depending on the type of law you're doing. But even if you're, you know, if you're fighting over widgets, that still matters to the person who owns the widget company and the person who you know thinks the widget company did something wrong, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah it's just the and it's and again, it's sort of similar as an accountant, right? You're on the one hand, the numbers are what they are, but you're trying to present things in the best way possible for your client, you know, with the taxing authorities. Um, and, you know, and sometimes you got to, you got to tell them, you know, hard truths, right. Which right. lawyers also have to do. And, uh, you know, I'd imagine there's some similar stresses there as well. Yeah, for sure. I know that, you know, certainly my, I look at my clients as relationships uh, versus transactional. Right. Um, and so you do, you do care because it's some of this stuff has major financial impact on these people. It could be the closure of their business or right. or losing an inheritance or right. or all those different things and and you do you want to have compa- uh, compassion, empathy, and then also, I always have to say to people sometimes when they're telling me everything listen i I really feel for you, but I also have to not let your problems become my problems, or then we all go down right. Yeah, and it, maintaining that separation is really important for both the practitioner and for the client, right? I mean, yeah. it's that you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's and and maintaining that steady distance does not mean a lack of empathy or that you're not even, you know, maybe inwardly really carrying it, but you have to you have to be that rock, you know, on some level in, in this job, you know, in these, when you're doing client service, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So what would you say um, to somebody out there that's thinking, I might need a trust, I don't need a trust? Mm. What would you say to those people that are out there sort of on the fence? I mean, they more than likely need it. Right. Um, I mean, even, you know, even if you're, if you don't have substantial wealth, having a trust just creates a greater chance at um, certainty down the line. Yeah. So it's worth, yeah, I, I have a, I have a, <laughs> I have a client who always says, you know, pay the $2, right? Um, you know, yes, it costs some money now up front, but you're, you're buying some degree of peace and knowing that, you know, whenever your time comes, you know, you're not going to be sitting there on your deathbed. Your, your last thought's not going to be, Oh, I didn't, 
I didn't plan for this, right? right? And so, so just do it. You know, it gives you peace of mind. And also, if you have if you have kids, you know, doing your estate planning, this goes beyond just trusts. But yeah, you know, knowing who's going to be in charge and having it in writing, you know, you maximize the chances that you're protecting them. Um, you're protecting your loved ones from 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 a fight down the line. So even if it's even if it's just you know. Uh, your record collection and you know your bank account that you're dividing up better for people to know and make sure you put everything in the name of the trust you know to the extent you can uh, at a time that's the other thing so yeah I would recommend it um, and go to someone who knows what they're doing would be my other yeah. recommendation you, know? you, you get what you pay for most exactly. of the time exactly well so let me ask I have one final question okay. it's sort of it's um so most people don't like paying for trusts right uh, right or legal fees, right? <laughs> or accounting fees, probably. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is the one thing you don't like to spend money on? Like it drives you crazy. Oh. Like, ah, oh, I hate putting money out for that. Oh, that's a, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, there's so much that I don't enjoy spending money on that it's, it's really I'm kind of <laughs> um, racking my brain. Um, You know, um, at the same time, I think about. I don't mean to not answer the question, but I'm just going. It's a lawyer thing. I get it. Yeah, I'm going through. (laughs) I'm going through my monthly expenses. It's like, well, I don't like paying my kids tuition, but I like that they're going to the school they go to. But they get a benefit, yeah. Right. I don't like paying, you know, car insurance, but I'll I'll like it if I get into an accident. Um, Um. Nobody likes paying taxes, but I, I like um, having institutions. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Bob. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. All right. Think about what do you love to spend money on, no matter what? Like a good sushi meal? Yes. I, I love a good sushi meal. That is That's absolutely awesome. The case. Yeah. I will spend money on a good sushi meal. I will... Um, I will spend money on this nice uh, office chair I got since I'm working at home. You know, um, you know things that that will create some degree of comfort. Um, honestly, this sounds super self-serving. I like to be able to, you know, contribute to causes that I care about as well. You know, because you get not just a tax benefit, but you know, which you do get, but um, some sort of psychic benefit from from helping people too. So I do like that as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely important. I think that's a. a- for me, a big motivator is to be able to pay it forward. Yes. Yes. Help other people. Exactly. Yeah. So, so sorry, sorry yep. for not answering your other question. But oh, that's no, that's totally true. fine. I actually, yeah. I know we're probably going to go over slightly, but I don't know if I, um, I have to share the sushi story uh, <laughs> with Peter and I. Okay. Um, and uh, so I had gone to this, there was this amazing sushi place down the street for me in this little uh, like strip mall. Apparently, like number two sushi place in LA. Oh, wow. um, they only have like ten tables, um, and the you know the mom seats everybody. The daughter takes the order, and the dad's the sushi guy. And uh, my college had taken had had somebody take me out to dinner the night before, and I went there, and it was the most amazing sushi I'd ever had. And I didn't see the bill, and so the next day, Peter and I had to drive to San Diego to go to the club, and he said, "Hey, do you want to grab some food?" And I said, "Hey, there's a sushi place." right by my house, which is right by the freeway that we needed to take. And uh, we went in and we ate and it was amazing. Uh, and he was like, this is the best sushi. And we did not have alcohol, by the way. We, it was okay. just like <laughs> sushi. Uh, the bill came back, it was about $600 cool. uh, without the tip. And Peter was like, Bob. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea. So then I had to call the college back and say, was the bill like five or $600? They were like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, I'll spend 200 bucks on sushi for two people, but 600, 500. Very, very, I mean, um, (laughs) there there are very few meals that are are worth that kind of price tag to me, but yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, it was definitely I worth it. See the look on his face. Yeah. Oh, he was mortified. Yeah. The upside was one of the beer companies paid for the weekend that we had with the staff, so it sort of made up for the money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> sort of balanced out, but uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's good so sushi funny. dinners. I love them. I yeah, love yeah them. me too. <laughs> me too. Uh, yeah. So, Nick, where can people find you online? Yeah, no, that's a that's a fine question. So, I'm at uh, Shepherd Mullen. This is the name of my firm. Um, 
big law firm, www.shepardmullen.com. That's S-H-E-P-P-A-R-D-M-U-L-L-I-N.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. If you look up Nicholas Van Brunt, lawyer, usually that'll just come up on, on Google. So uh, yeah, those are two good places to find me. Perfect. So if you're already in trouble with your trust, reach out to Nick. And if you're thinking about not getting in trouble with trust, reach out to one of his partners. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And they will get you set up. Um, Absolutely. No, that's amazing. Well, I don't want to forget our listeners out there. Please don't forget to share the love. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Search for Money You Should Ask, all one word. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon, or your favorite podcast player. And if you prefer to watch our episodes, head over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. Nick, thanks so much for coming on, giving us a little enlightenment about trusts. I can trust you. (laughs) Well, you could trust me that I had a great time. And uh, thank you, Bob, for inviting me on. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah.